too small. Let's do it on the floor. And then we're going to help me here. I need a helper. And I'm sorry if you can't see it because of where you are sitting, but maybe you can stand up and do it. Anybody want to? Anybody brave enough to take a chance? Yes. Now you can. Kind of, you cringe, yes. <laughs> you kind of cringe when you heard about the Panther. So what team do you support? Other back. We're not really in the same division anyway. No, it's okay. As long as you don't support the uh, Falcons or the Buccaneers, no. then we can still live together. <laughs> in peace we don't. Alright, so what is your name? I'm Ginger. Ginger. I have four rows of cards there, right? Mm -hmm. If you could pick any two this way. Vertical. Any vertical? Yeah, tell us so that we can follow. Yeah. Out of the same column? Yes, the columns, that's right, that's a better news. Uh, you don't have to pick them up, just tell us which one. The... No, just that. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> this column or this column? I guess These the... two. Must These be a pack of fans. One more, one more column, please. Okay. All right, so how about now two pairs? I hope by the time I get to the real talk, you folks will be this attentive. <laughs> All right, a pair, any directions? Okay. And now, one or the other. Okay. All right, folks, of the 52 cards in the deck, which one do you think can be a symbol for Jesus? King. King of hearts. King of hearts, right? King of love. Can you flip that card over for us? You have chosen well. <laughs> All right, so I suppose the whole series, I think about us. I suppose the whole series, in fact, any ministry in the church should be about choosing Jesus. Right? That's the whole purpose of our life. Choosing Jesus and all our Jesus who have chosen us to sort of lead us in life. I guess with a little introduction, shall we begin with a prayer? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we know that you are with us. Help us to recognize your presence here with us today. And your presence with us every moment of our days. Help us to be witnesses of your loving presence among our brothers and sisters. You are our Lord and God forever and ever. St. Francis de Sales, St. John Bosco, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. So, I got a chance to share with you a few things. I won't read, but I, at my age, I start to forget things, so I do have to have this every now and then, so I will lose track of where I am. Alright, so as Kristen introduced me, I uh, was born and raised in Vietnam, and uh, not about myself, but my journey, my faith journey, hopefully it kind of helps you to see why I appreciate the Salesian spirituality and the impact St. John Bosco and his followers have had on me. And hopefully by that you have something hopefully you can, you can use or may find it useful. So anyway, I began as a first grader in the communist system of education. Any of you are familiar with communism? Basically, it's an ideology that denies the existence of God. They don't believe in God. They have no use for God. So by the time I started first grade, which was right after the end of the Vietnam War, there was no longer private schools at all, and for sure no Catholic schools. The communists, for sure, especially in Vietnam, um, sort of take control of the training of young people. Sort of, you got to brainwash them when they were young, you know if you want them to be your followers. Those of you who are teachers know the impression of our whole minds of kids. And what about the teachers? That's, that's the way it goes. So anyway, there's no, as I said, in Vietnam by that, there was no private school, there's no Catholic education. Even today, uh, 40 years now, after the end of the war, there's still no role for the church in education. 
religious instruction and stuff is allowed. Or not. Anyway, so um, that's what I was trained in, you know, so I'm thoroughbred communist, if you will. I learned communism when I was still a little bit, six years old, my first grade, uh, all the way up to 12 years of school and then three and a half years or so of college. Every year we would have to take something related to communism or socialism of one kind or another. Um, I really don't know much about Vietnam today because I haven't been back there. Uh, so you, at least, but in general, you would not consider it religious persecution as you would think of, let's say, in Iraq during the time of the ISIS control, or in Saudi Arabia, let's say, or even in China today. But for sure there was religious suppression and restriction. So, for example, when I was preparing for First Communion, because the government, the communist government, was still kind of fresh, so there was still a lot of flexibility, so we were allowed to have religious instruction and what have not. But then by the time I got to confirmation a few years later, and it actually got even worse, the guys who were younger than me, religious instruction was forbidden. So we would have to do it in secret. So it could be, you know, moving from home to home. Because uh, I guess they couldn't control everybody and everybody's movement. Or even if the class takes place on the property of the parish, then uh, it would not ever be in a classroom setting. We would not be allowed to bring in notebooks, textbooks, pencils, uh, nothing like that. Because we could not afford getting caught with those things. Little kids won't get in trouble, but their parents or the priests in the parish would be in trouble. Or let's say a group of us sitting like this uh, at the corner of a basketball uh, court or a soccer field, and if a stranger comes nearby, <coughs> the class quickly changes into the adult telling the story to the kids. <laughs> And the class time would always be scheduled during mass time because the government by then still allow masses to take place, but no religious instruction. So class would begin. As soon as the mass ends, we would have to finish class and walk out away from the parish together with the people who were leaving for mass. So anyway, that's one aspect of it. Uh, the other thing was at school, besides having to learn communism, we. Uh, could not really talk about religion and such. The government or even told us, if your parents say things against the revolution, as they call it, we are supposed to report our parents. You know, imagine that. But that's how they kind of brainwashed it. And for sure, over the history of communism, whether in China, Russia, Vietnam, whatever, that actually happened. I don't thank God I was not that stupid. I didn't report my parents. <laughs> but I wonder uh, what really can get into a, a young person's mind to get to that, that kind of um, I don't know, betrayal, I guess, that would be the right word. Um, so, as I said, that's, there was really no strict persecution, but there were repression and restriction. So, for example, Christmas can happen on a weekday. And you know for sure, if Christmas is on a weekday, that will be a day for final exams. So. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't cut school on the day of exams, so you got to go to school on Christmas Day even. So that's, those kind of other things the government would do, that you can't really say they suppress religion, but that's how they would do it, to make life difficult. And then poverty, just imagine a country after, you know, a hundred years or so of war between the, the French colonial days and then the Vietnam War and all that. So school was really tough for us, besides you could not be free to could not be really a kid. Yeah, there was hardly anything to enjoy other than going to school and hanging out with friends. I remember when I was in high school, this, the high school had a soccer field, but it's just a dirt field. There's no grass. And by the time I got to maybe my junior year, the soccer, uh, the, the goalposts that were made of wood had rotten away, and there was no replacement. And we just played pickup games and you know a pile of clothes to mark the goalposts and all that. I remember my two brothers who were older and a little bit more uh, industrious, I guess. They would collect uh, soccer balls. They like one get flat or drop, you know, go bad. But they would throw that away, they would save it. And after a while, you got a piece from this ball, another piece from another ball, a third piece from the third ball, and sew it together, and you got something that is round and kickable. <laughs> That's going to be the new soccer ball. You know? 
Now, but this is a part that makes life fun for me and a lot of other kids. At the Salesian Parish, there was a soccer field mm -hmm. and this grass has goalposts. And while at school, we had to organize our own games and just pick up games. The brothers at the parish organized tournaments and we had jerseys and trophies and prizes and stuff, you know. So church was great. As I said, I was 14, I went to the parish every day because we had to play soccer. They were pretty tricky. They made us go to, or they would encourage us, go to adoration at the end of the day for about 30 minutes. They would not force us, but you don't go to adoration, sorry you can't play soccer. The next day. <laughs> so that's kind of you. I hope that was not recorded. Anyway, so when I was 12, 14 years old, you know, all right, I'll go to adoration for 30 minutes. I, I can deal with that. As long as you get to play soccer for a couple hours. Um, but that's how the Salesian priests and brothers sort of gave us a sense of, um, of joy, of freedom. We could be ourselves at the parish. You know, as kids, you know, nothing you think about religion or some fancy things. As long as we could run around and have fun, that's, that's good enough. Um, later on, I'll go more into St. John Bosco himself, but that was a a very important principle in Don Bosco's system of education and faith formation that young people have to have the opportunity to be kids and have to have fun. Uh, he even said, if you are on good terms with God, then you should be happy. Uh, Dominic Savio, one of his students, who is actually a youngest, one of the youngest canonized saints in the church, said about being holy consists of being happy. Uh, St. John Bosco himself said, jump, run, make noise or shout, do whatever you want, as long as you do not sit. So for me now, looking back as an adult, as a priest, you know, being trained in that system, I for sure saw how the priests and the brothers sort of educated us in that system of education and spirituality without really telling us the theory, you know. And as I said, because life was so difficult outside of the church com complex, or eat outside of our families. Um, they make church and the faith something very relatable to us. Something that we get to enjoy. Now, we may not be able to explain the doctrines and all of that, but we know that church is a good place to be, a place where we could be at peace, we could be ourselves. Um, and so, if we think of St. Francis de Sales and St. John Bosco, yeah, a couple of things that I said, hoping to share my story, just to share with you how they continue to uh, impact and have a, an influence on the lives of young people today, uh, 150 years or so after the founding of our society. That's the name of it. I brought it just to make sure the spelling, because some people say the sales <coughs> it's a, some other pronunciation. <laughs> So anyway, a little bit about the two of them, just a bit information, biography, for sure you can look, look it up on Wikipedia and all that, you don't need to hear a lecture on me about their, their lives. Um, but Francis de Sales was born during the, um, the time of a lot of turmoil in, in Europe. It was during the time of the Reformation and the period of the uh, Counter-Reformation, or we today may call it the Catholic Reformation. Uh, he came from a noble family, and his father had great hopes in him that he'll be a big shot in the royal court. So he actually went to law school and uh, finished the degree and became a lawyer. But in the, he kind of made a, a deal with his parents that they would allow him to study theology. Too. So he actually had a doctorate degree in law and also a doctorate in theology. But all along, he did not tell his dad because he did not know how to break the news. But his mother knew that he wanted to become a priest, not so much of a lawyer. Uh, so eventually, they kind of, he and his mother were able to convince the father to let him be a priest. So he had to sign the inheritance off to his younger brother, who was going to take the realm of the family and you know, be somebody. And uh, and he was appointed a bishop of Geneva. By that time. Geneva had be, become a, a Calvinist city. Um, and so his mission, he thought, was going in to uh, bring these people back to the Catholic faith. 
And uh, today historians would say that there were about 60,000 people in that city. He only was allowed to get in on his knuckle and, and get, set his foot into that city only twice because he basically got kicked out. You know? um, the first three years of all these efforts to preach to the people and all that, people slammed the door at his face, uh, chased him out of their town, uh, complained and all that. So while they, they would not listen to him, he would write and uh, slip his homily or his lectures under the people's doors. After three years of getting nothing done, uh, but he did not give up. That's one of the great virtues of Francis de Sales was patience and also gentleness. Even people, because of him, shut the door at his face. He did not give up. By the end of his life, apparently, he brought about 40,000 of those people back to the Catholic Church. Um, so one thing about him is this sense of gentleness and patience. The other thing about him was this incredible zeal to bring people to God. And uh, just imagine that all those works that he did. And he walked from place to place. And they even said there was a time when he was kind of stuck in the middle of the forest, trying to get from one place to another. And because of wild animals and stuff, so he had to climb up on a tree to, uh, to spend the night. And he had to use the belt to tie himself on the branch so that he would not fall off the branch. And that's how he spent the night trying to stay away from the wolves or the, the bear or whatever. So this guy has an incredible zeal and commitment about bringing people back to God, or bringing people to God. So a while later, he was around, I think, in the 1600, early 1600. Uh, St. John Bosco was born in 1815, so 200 years later. Um, when John Bosco became a priest, he was exposed to, I guess, the right way. He was walking the city of Turin, and he saw all these young people who had left their homes uh, in the countryside looking for jobs in the city. And nobody looked after them, nobody cared for them. Some of them were orphans, but for sure most of them got a letter to their own elements and devices. So um, he told the call from God to take care of these young people. If you're familiar with him, you know also when he was about nine years old, he had a dream of being with a group of kids and they turn violent, they start fighting and cursing. And so he jumped in and tried to break up the fight. And uh, at that time, these animals, I mean, I'm um, sorry, these young people became turned into wild animals. And then the, and the man, a gentleman, showed up and told him, that's not by fist fight by violence that he's going to help them, but by gentleness and patience. Uh, so he did not know what's going on, you know, a little nine-year-old boy. Uh, and he said, who are you telling me all of these things? And the gentleman said, I'm going to give you a teacher. With her, you will understand. And everything will work out. And this lady of Jesus. Later on, he interpreted that with Jesus and Mary, who showed him the way again. It was by the, the way of gentleness and kindness. And when this lady appeared, all these wild animals flocked over to her and turned into gentle lamb. And so later on, he interpreted that when he saw all these crazy kids in the city of Turin as God's mission for him. And then he realized from that dream that he had to take care of them with kindness and with gentleness. So he learned that reality, and he also was introduced to Francis de Sales before that. So he wanted to learn the spirituality and the system of Francis de Sales in taking care of people, of gentleness and of patience. Also the idea of this commitment, this zeal for the kingdom of God from Francis de Sales. Because Don Bosco would spend the rest of his life working for these young people. So that's why he picked up the idea of zeal. In fact, when he died at the age of 72 or 73, the doctor said he did not really have any deadly disease, you know, say cancer or, or a stroke or anything. He basically was dying because he had burned himself like a candle from both ends. <laughs> this man really woke himself to the bone, to death. Um, so, kind of a little bit about the system, the spirituality of these, these two saints. And um, what do we learn from it? Um, that joy, that patience, 
that gentleness is really deeply rooted in their encounter with God. The Salesian spirituality has its biblical roots in the incarnation. And I think this is a good timing because in, in two weeks or so, we'll begin uh, the new liturgical year, right? year A, right? we we'll look at the Gospel of Matthew. And in the Gospel of Matthew, we receive the name of Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. Um, in fact, if you look at different readings from the prophet Isaiah during the season of Advent, we hear of this promised king who will be with the people and who will lead them to God. So that's the understanding that Salesian spirituality uh, has, looking at the Savior, the Emmanuel, who is with us. And at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, before the ascension, Jesus said, I will be with you always until the end of time. Um, so that is very important for us today um, as Salesians, but also for all Christians. How do we handle the challenges, the difficulties of life if we do not believe that God is with us? Um, there's a whole movement in our church today. Um, in fact, Pope Francis just talked about it as prophets of doom. Yeah, people talk about it. The world is about to end. Now, the world will end. And we know that we, Jesus has told us that. But the kingdom of God is here has begun, and the world that we know of, the physical reality, will come to an end when the kingdom of God reaches its fullness. So for sure there will be the difficulties, the challenges that we'll face, whether in the world, in our personal life, in our families, and the rest of it. But the Emmanuel, the Son of God, is with us. So Francis de Sales and John Bosco had this incredible belief in that. Um, John Bosco, I actually had brought a video clip, but we could not get the, the TV to work. Um, you know, when he met all these kids, well, he had no money. He had no helpers. He really started with nothing. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to the city of Turin, he built a church dedicated to many help of Christians, who he believed as the one who guided him all along. Uh, really, and we say she's the one who began the, the society or the, the congregation that we belong to. When he began this construction, the first payment he made to the, con the, uh, the builder or the contractor, eight pennies. And the guy got a little bit and said, what? <laughs> but that, the, that was the kind of faith that he had in God. Uh, he said, yeah, we'll be fine. One of his assistants, Blessed Michael Ruhr, as the, as the financial administrator would sometimes would put money away when he knew there's a big bill was coming up, you know. And St. John Bosco would kind of yell at him and say, you have no faith. <laughs> you can't put money away. <laughs> now, you folks, as the, you know, you, you live in the world, you have to think of the future, you have to start planning for retirement and all that good stuff. So that may not be possible for us, but the kind of faith that these people had in God, you know. Um, so, about the, the two of them, I'll, I'll end with just a few quotes. One is about the Incarnation again. Uh, Francis de Sales is known for a simple expression, live Jesus. So he see that his whole life is dedicated to bring about uh, the life of Christ in people. Live Jesus. That Christ lives, not him. You know, think of John the Baptist. You know, that I must increase and Christ must increase. So that's his, his idea, live Jesus. But also the understanding that Jesus is alive. Jesus is not somebody who is dead or away from us. Um, and I think that's so important for us to know that Christ is alive in our hearts. Christ is alive in the other person. That Christ is alive in the whole of humanity. You know, think of the political tension in our country these days. Imagine if I believe that Christ is present in the person in front of me, how would I treat that person? Um, the, the, you know, the kind of name calling and stuff that we experienced <coughs> recently. For sure, that's, I don't mean people don't believe in God, but do they live that reality that God is present? Um, and then uh, about the gentleness part, 
Francis de Sales said, the trunk of honey attracts or draws more flies than a whole barrel of vinegar. A trunk of honey attracts more flies than a whole barrel of vinegar. Just imagine the way we Christians live our lives, that live Jesus in such a way of love and of gentleness and of kindness that people will feel attracted to Jesus. Uh, not by condemnation, for sure. Uh, and maybe one of the things that I, would, I was thinking of, it depends on how much time we have at the end, or maybe in your own experience, you can share with each other where you had experienced the presence of God in another person. Uh, what kind of a God do we experience? What kind of a God do we project to others? Um, and St. John Bosco picked that up for him. It's very important. Because all of these kids that he was working with um, were tough kids. And so for him, he's not going to attract them to, to God, to goodness, if they don't know that they are loved. In fact, he said about educators, or to us, but I suppose all of you who, who work with young people, and those who are called to the vocation of marriage, this may be something that you can uh, make use of. He said, it's not enough that you love a young person. That person must know that he is loved. Think of sometimes as parents. You, know, you work hard, you take care of the kids, you sacrifice, you put on food on the table, all of that. But just, you never have time for the kid. The kid said, Mom or dad never had time for me. Uh, so it's not enough that we love the young, the young person, or the young people must know who they are. Um, Francis de Sales, one more thing, said, He who preaches with love, preaches effectively. And then the second one about zeal, um, Don Bosco said, For you I study, for you I work, for you I am even ready to lay down my life both about the love, but also that dedication. And he wants a young person to know that God loves him, and loves her. That's ultimately the goal of his life, to bring young people to the love of God. Live Jesus. So those are the things that, uh, in a short time that I have, hope to share with you, and hopefully it will help. And the last thing then, kind of a practical things, you can count the five key elements of Salesian spirituality on your five fingers. The J for Jesus, live Jesus. And also the J for joy, the idea. God is with us, so we have to be, we should be cheerful and happy. Uh, so that's for the first two fingers. The middle fingers is, tend to be the longest fingers. Right? We have a brother in one of our communities, he used to teach carpentry, and he lost that part. Of the so this, this thing will work with him, but for most of us, <laughs> the longest finger reminds us of the best of all of God's creation, His Mary, the mother of Jesus. Don Bosco would call her the help of Christians. Um, think about it when we pray the Hail Mary. It's an ex incredible exp expression of trust. We ask the mother of God to pray for us now and at the hour of our death. So she's both a mother, a help, the intercessor, but also her presence with us. So that's the long finger to remind us of her. Um, this finger, where most of us, those who are married, wear a ring. The commitment, the responsibility. Francis de Sales actually said about holiness. That's why I start with the, the trick about choosing Jesus. Francis de Sales said, we choose Jesus and we live in a relationship with God, or what he would call it, the devout life. Not by doing something beyond our responsibilities or vocation. He even said for a bishop to think that he had to spend hours in prayer like a monk, he's not becoming holy, because he's neglecting his responsibility of running a diocese. And he said for a mother or a father to think that he has to fast, he, she has to fast and, uh, you know, go to church, and spend long hours in prayer, and neglect the responsibility of a mother or a father. 
that person is not growing in holiness. So, but it's in the commitment. If we believe that God calls us to a certain path, God gives us a certain opportunity to live the gospel, to live Jesus, and that this in our daily life and situations, as a professional, as a teacher, as a student, as a worker, whatever we find ourselves, that's where we grow in holiness. Um, St. John Bosco, there was a story about Dominic Savio. He wanted to fast. He wanted to put rocks in his bed so he could not sleep well as a way of doing penance. And then he falls asleep in class you know, because he did not sleep well at night. <laughs> so as Don Bosco learned about this, he told him, get, get rid of the rocks and stuff in your bed. When it's time to sleep, you sleep. When it's time to pray, you pray. When it's time to eat, you eat. When it's time to go study, you study. And when it's time to play, you play. And that's how the secret of, or he told her, get the secret of becoming holy. Live the vocation that God has given to us. Think about it. Let's say Lent, you know. I want to go out, say, give up chocolate or whatever that I want to do. At the end of the day, it could be what I want to do. But how about the stuff that God wants me to do? You know, maybe I'm you know, driving in Chicago today. I don't know how many people I first that, you know. <laughs> not the penance that I plan on, but the penance that God put along to that, my path. Seven miles from St. John Bosco Parish to here, two minutes and 45 minutes. It's a couple of kind of thing. But I did not let the gift of holiness, the presence of Jesus, driving here today for sure. So it is the daily life that God gives to us, the opportunity to grow in love and share the love of God with others. And the last thing is the little things. It's not the big thing. Some of us, some of you, God may call to do great things. But I don't know, I'm not a prophet. But if you are called to do great things, you got to start with the little things first. A word of kindness to a roommate. Um, a moment of patience to the person in front of you at Starbucks. <laughs> or whatever, you know. Those are the moments, the opportunities that God gives to us. It's, sometimes it's hard because we want to do the things that we want, but we may neglect the opportunities that God gives to us. As St. John Bosco told down next time, when it's time to play, you play. When it's time to sleep, you sleep. When it's time to study, you study. And that's how you become whole. It's the little things. Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa had the same kind of idea, right? She said, not all of us are called to do extraordinary things, but all of us are called to do ordinary things with great love. It's the, the little things. Um, so, the five fingers. I hope it's easy to remember. Uh, and then, the last thing I would leave with you. Something from Pope Francis. Any of, any of you follow Francis on uh, Twitter? <laughs> I think this just came out yesterday. We don't have to go far or come up with grand projects to be charitable. Often the people closest to us could use our help. The pinky. <laughs> Alright, so those five things. I think that's good enough for now. Questions, thoughts, comments? Um, yes. I think we'll break for a second and then okay. go back for questions. Okay. Um, Sounds before good. we break, I'm 